Oh, now you're also quiet. That's great. Good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you. If you would please stand, I'd love to begin this morning with a reading of the word. This is Psalm 8. David is writing in praise to the Creator God, and he says this. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, and out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. And when I look at your heavens and the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with a glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. From the dawn of creation, God has established his favor for his people. And we're going to sing and rejoice in the glory of God and his love for us by the sending of his son.
you take a welcome, uh, take a moment to welcome your neighbor here today? Well, good morning again. It's wonderful to sing praises to our God together. Um, if you are a guest here, maybe it's your first time, maybe you're a new student over at GU or something like that, we would love to be able to connect with you. And the way that we can primarily do that uh, is through our connection cards, which you may find in the pew or maybe at the front desk. Uh, it's just a chance for us to uh, get to know you and hopefully get you uh, plugged in to one of our ministries. If you have a prayer request, uh, we would love to be able to pray for you over that and uh, chat with you about you know, things going on in your life all those things. So, uh, yeah, if that's something that uh, you would like to do, we would love to receive those and, and have a chance to communicate, get you involved, get you plugged in. We're going to continue worshiping today and glorifying our King Jesus. There was a moment when the lights went out Death had claimed its victory. The King of Love had given up his life. The darkest day in history. There on a cross they made for sinners. For every curse, blood atoned. Final breath, and it was finished. But not the end we could have known. For in an earth began to shake, and the veil was torn. But sacrifice was made as the heavens arose.
God, oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That beautiful name, Jesus, born of a virgin, crucified and raised to life on the third day. That Jesus ascended into heaven, seated at your right hand. That King Jesus coming again to take his bride to be with him forever. You, King Jesus, beautiful, wonderful, powerful name. King Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your gift and for your treasure of new life. It's in your glorious, powerful name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. What a glorious, beautiful name is the name of Jesus. We have an opportunity on Sunday, September the 25th, to let our community see that name, to see that beauty, that glory and work. We are going to be using that day as a, as a service day. And on the 25th of September, we'll be having one service. Uh, we're going to ask that you come and be a part of this as we collectively work together to serve people within our church, within our community, within the area. Uh, and we are really looking forward to this. What we are needing are people that will be willing to lead or co-lead uh, some of the teams that will be going out into community. So if you'd like to lead one of those teams be in charge of that particular project, uh, then please call the church office, talk with Nathan, see one of us, and let us know that you'll be willing to do that as we uh, take the name of Jesus Christ out to our community on September the 25th on that Sunday. If you have uh, traveled much, you've probably gone into a hotel and there on the desk or on inside a drawer you will see a Gideon's Bible. There is no other organization I know that has done more to put the Bible out into the public than probably the Gideons. Uh, we are fortunate that we have representatives here in our community and in our church that work uh, uh, very closely with Gideons and work with them. Uh, this morning, John Wright is going to come to share that ministry with us and telling us some of the stories that take place with Gideons and uh, the work that they do. John, would you come, please? Thank you, Dee. Um, for a lot of years, this church has allowed Gideons to come and talk to you about who we are and what we do. And I think one of the major things that you have heard is that we th see ourselves as extension, as an extension of Bond County churches. And naturally, then, that would include uh, First Christian Church here in Greenville. And uh, we think we have some pretty good reasons for uh, wanting First Christian Church and for including uh, First Christian Church uh, in that list. One of those reasons is your generosity. 
your generosity has made us able to place, I have no idea how many of these Bibles in a bunch of different places in and around Greenville and in, in Bond County, and not just in motel rooms or hotel rooms either. Uh, we've been able to place them in banks, uh, in uh, pharmacies, in uh, vehicle repair places, and of course in a uh, nursing home and, uh, and, and in the hospital. And uh, at the same time, handout, I, you know, this small Gideon New Testament, I don't know how many of these, I, countless numbers of these, and your generosity has enabled us, has helped us to be able to do that sort of thing. And I got to tell you that we Gideons praise the Lord uh, for working through you to enable us to do what he has called us to do. Uh, a second reason that we Gideons see ourselves as an extension of First Christian Church uh, is the base that we operate on as Gideons. It is, in fact, the same base, we, we're sure of it, the same base that God calls every born-again believer on the face of this earth to operate on, the same platform that God calls his people to operate on. Uh, I want to read that base to you now from uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. This is what Paul writes. Therefore, this is familiar scripture, I'm sure. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and, here it is, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And here it is again, entrusting to us, we born-again believers who are born-again adopted children of the Lord, uh, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Here's the deal. God has called you, born-again believers, to be ambassadors for Christ. By the same token, he has called every born-again believer who is a Gideon to be an ambassador for Christ. And we know in our hearts that make that that calling makes us one with our brothers and sisters at First Christian Church in Greenville, Illinois. Now, there is something that I have learned about being a Gideon and at the same time being an ambassador for Christ. Uh, it's just this. From time to time, God gives fantastically marvelous adventures to his ambassadors. And I want to share one with you now that he has given to me. Now, I know some maybe have, have heard about it, but it is one of my favorite adventures that God has given me, and I want, I want to share it. And it is just this. My wife, Guynetta, and I were having lunch at a Golden Corral. And as we finished, I, I noted, noticed a table across the room with some adults, naturally, and then some youngsters at the table. And so I went across... And uh, I, I apologize for my intrusion, but I said, would, would you permit me, I'm talking to the adults, would you permit me to give Gideon New Testament to these youngsters if they want one? And the youngsters all wanted one, and the adults gave me permission. But I didn't have enough on me at the time, so I had to go to the car to, uh, to get some more. And naturally, as I went, to, went out, I went past the counter, and I said to the young lady behind the counter, I'm going to the car, I won't be very long, I need to get something, I'll be right back. And uh, she responded immediately by saying, wait, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't go out of the restaurant and come back right away. We, we, we don't allow that here. You cannot do that. Well, I, and uh, she said, I, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's okay. You can go and you can come back. And that's okay. 
So I went to the car and got the New Testament, and I made sure that I had an extra. And when I went back, I opened the door and went in, and it was apparent immediately God had set the stage. And, and so I said to her, to this young lady, think of it, the, the, the way I knew he had set the stage, she was the only one behind the counter now. There are usually two, but she was the only one. And there was nobody coming, nobody going. She was the only one there. So I said to her, would you permit me to give you a Gideon New Testament? And she said, yes, she would. And, and then I said, so I gave it to her, but I also said, uh, be sure to look at the last two pages because that is a roadmap to heaven. It tells you how to get there. And at that moment, I, it was just there. The moment was there, and I knew that God had opened the door. It was, it was just there. And so I said to her, would you permit me to ask you the most important question anybody's ever going to ask you on the face of the earth? Now, now wait, wait, I'm not going to ask you to marry me because I'm 82 years old and I'm already married. And, and she laughed, she giggled, and she said, uh, yes, you can ask me. So I, so I asked her, I said, uh, do you want to go to heaven when you die? And she said, yes, I do. I said, on a, on a scale of zero to 100%, what percent would you say that if you were to die today, you'd be sure that you would go to heaven? And she said, 80%. Uh, well, you know, that's a, that's a good percent. We talked a little bit about that's, that's a good percent. I said, uh, my brain just went dead. <laughs> Don't worry, it will come back. And, and if it doesn't, Tyson will have to wait till he gets to preach anyway. Uh, so I said, do you want to go to heaven when you die? She said, yeah, 80%. And I said, okay. She said, 80%. We talked about that. I said, uh, how would you like to be 100%? And she said, well, yes, I would. And so I got to share the gospel with her. And in the end, we prayed together. And she asked Jesus into her heart and received Christ as her Savior. That is a fantastically marvelous experience, a fantastically marvelous adventure that the Lord gave to this Gideon. And I praise him for it today. Well, there is another reason that we Gideons believe that we are an extension of First Christian Church. And that reason is the second critically important base, second critically important platform that we operate on as Gideons. And I, I'm going to read now. I, I read it first service. I'm going to read it now again because I don't want to mess this up. I want to read exactly what I wrote because this, this is it. The Apostle Paul shows plainly what that platform is, what that base is in his description of that Passover moment when Jesus invites every born-again believer on earth to remember the Christ who made possible the eternal life that rests now in our hearts. And I want to read that base to you as you prepare for communion. Please now, prepare for communion as I read that base to you from 1 Corinthians 11 verses 23 through 26. And here's what Paul writes. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then Paul writes, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we take the wafer, we remember the broken body of Christ who went to the cross, taking every one of my sins in his body on that tree. When he went to the cross, not only mine, he took 
every one of your sins in his body on that tree. We remember what he did with this wafer. And then as we take the cup, as we drink, as we drink together, we say yes to the new covenant that is in the blood of Christ. Father in heaven, there is no way on this earth we can thank you adequately for that time or that day that Christ went to the cross for us to give us the life that is eternal. Thank you. Praise you in his name. In his name we pray and praise. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give God glory for what Jesus has done for us so we can remember that. And let's also praise God for the Gideons and Gideons all over the world that put uh, Bibles in the hands of people that are growing in the faith and people have never heard the good news of Jesus. Let's praise them and thank John as he leaves today. Let's give God glory. Gideons have been helping people grow in God's Word for 123 years. I did a little research this week. Uh, their group started in a small town in Wisconsin. But at this point, in 2022, they have now uh, delivered the good news into over 200 um, bill, no, excuse me, 2 billion people's hands in 200 countries. And their work is still growing. Uh, so if you would like to know more about the Gideons or be generous to their uh, ministry here in Bond County, you want to be a part of that, please talk to John. Uh, they meet right here in this building uh, on a regular basis, and they're doing great things. This month, we have been focused on growing deep in God's Word. But I want to give you a bigger picture of our grow uh, plans and the way God is leading us to grow. There's three main aspects that we believe God's calling us to grow in, and it's this. We're committed to grow out witnessing with the gospel. That's that evangelism side of things. That's what, what you saw John do in the story uh, of the woman at the restaurant. This idea that we're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, so we're going to grow out with the gospel. We're also going to grow deep, being devoted to the Word. And then we're going to grow young, walking with one. And here, here's the concept of that. Walking with one is this idea that each of us, whether we're a John's age, my age, or one of the teenagers' age on the, on the stage today, that we would all identify someone who is younger in the faith than us, and walk with them, sharing Jesus with them and growing. It's this mentoring idea. It's discipleship. What a beautiful thing. By the way, this may have been one of the youngest appearances that we've had on stage in a long time. Our leaders are growing old and growing young together. I love to see the, the full body of Christ serve together. So let's give God glory for that, for our leaders. But this month, we are focusing on growing deep in God's Word. And somebody would say, well, why? Why do you want to grow deep in God's Word? Get this. This is radical. Maybe one of the things that will be hard to understand, but we're going to grow deep in God's Word because it's God's Word. It's not, that's not rocket science, but, but it's so important. Sometimes we can overcomplicate how we can get to know God, how we can grow deep with Him. There's no better way than to be devoted to spend time in His Word, the Holy Word. So, so here's really the first movement of this message. We're going to grow deep being devoted to the Word because it's God's Word. I believe each one of us from time to time need to take a moment to remember, to slow down, to refocus, to recommit, to revalue that this Bible is God's Word. We take it for granted. We sometimes uh, can disrespect it by the way we treat it. Too often we'll, we'll say this is God's word, but does it affect our lives? But the reality is uh, the words on, in this book, the, the words on your uh, device screen, whether it's a phone or a, a, a computer, the words on your wall that's painted or, or on a sticker, the words that have been placed in your heart are the word of God. And he desires to reveal his will and his message of the good news to you. Man, think about that. The God that created heaven and earth, the God that has more power than we can ever know, the God that has no beginning or end, the God that gave us his one and only son so that we could have salvation through him to be with him forever, that God has written his word to you. 
and to you and, and to all of us. And, and we need to respect it. We need to cherish it as, as the true God, his, his, his one word. It's radical to think about this. That he loves you enough to say, I want you to know me fully. And I want to know you fully. And we want to be in a relationship together. Uh, another way that I know it's God's word, the Bible tells us it's God's word. Now, this, this is logical thinking, but, but look what the word of God says about itself. It was in our reading from this week, as Paul writes Timothy. He says, all scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness so that the servant of God, that's all of us who have given our lives to him, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. As we read this, God is equipping us. He's training us for whatever he calls us to do. And this word that is from God's mouth himself, he is wanting us to be empowered to do his his will and his work. That is remarkable. It's a remarkable claim, what the Bible says about itself, that this is from the, the mouth of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit from its authors to us. Hey, but any book can claim to be God's Word. There are more than one book that claims to be God's Word. Uh, There are books in chapter 7, maybe it's chapter 1, or the last words. There have been books written over time by men and women to say, hey, this is from the mouth of God. Does that make them God's Word? No. So what sets apart the Bible to be different, to literally be the Word of God? One of the biggest factors, it has been tested over time and proven over thousands of years to be trustworthy of what it says and what it does and what it claims. Every generation, I don't know if you've noticed, and our generation actually may be doing it more than any, it has doubters and skeptics that, that will look through the Word of God and say, okay, this is going to be the time where we debunk this, where we uh, declassify it, where we disprove it, and the Bible will forever not be meaningful like we've always thought. And there's people that try to disprove it over and over again. But time and time again, historically, scientifically, and prophetically, it has proven to be true and trustworthy. I mean, think about just some of these stats. It was written by 40 different authors over about 2,000 years on three different continents, uh, and it speaks over hundreds of matters, uh, and all of them are tremendously uh, consistent and cohesive to God's big picture of salvation through Jesus. The Bible, time and time again, as it predicts something prophetically, it answers the call. For example, like that there would be a a child born to a virgin. And people from the east would come to worship him and, and he would be crucified on a cross, but, but not a bone would be broken. And there will be a day the prophecy that he will return will also come true. Time and time again, the Bible fulfills these prophecies and it can be trusted. Think about some of these stats. As I was doing research on the Gideons this week, I found this out. In 1455, uh, there was a book that was printed for the first time uh, with movable type. And and the creators of this movable type press said, we want our first book to really have value that we print on this press, to to really change the world forever. And you know what they chose to print? The Bible. What, What a great testimony. But it's also the book that's been most sold over the course of history. It's also the most translated book. It's the most quoted book. It's also the most persecuted book. There have been many times where it has been tried to be eradicated from culture, from from groups, from families, from nations. But like a weed, it just won't go away. It it, it thrives under the hardest of conditions. In fact, uh, still today, it will be sold more than any other new book. In fact, they they estimate 100 million copies will be sold this year alone. Just look at some of these stats. We believe uh, over the course of history that there have been 6 billion Holy Bibles distributed in the world. The the closest book that we know of to have any uh, high level of uh, copying is the Quran, 800 million. And then there's a Chinese dictionary, 400 million. And then the Tale of Two Cities, one of the greatest literary works of all time, is a distant fourth with 200 million. And then the Boy Scouts and the Book of Mormon comes in at 150. That's the order, okay? What a tremendous testimony uh, of just the value that our history, our world has put on this and God's promotion of it through the world. But with all that said, with all the science and prophecy and stats, I will never be able to convince any one of you that this is God's holy word by that. Just won't. I mean, I could go on the rest of the day with stats that that make it highly uh, uh, just valued and great moment of history, but the only way that you are personally ever going to know is by a step of faith. 
There are certainly a lot of things you could look at to, to have your mind wrap your brain around the fact it could be God's word, but there's a moment where you have to take a step of faith and say, I believe this is the word of God. And it's trustworthy to change my life. I want you to know this is what I believe. I believe this is actually God's word for my life and for the world. It's an epic love story of God wanting to be in relationship with us. How many of you have a grandchild, a niece or nephew, or a child in children's church today? Raise your hand if you know a child in children's church. A lot of us do here. They are learning right now this month that the Bible is God's epic love story to the world, to them. So today at lunch, as you travel home, maybe you're hanging out this afternoon, ask them, hey, what do you believe about God's word? And hear what they say. I hope they're going to say this is God's love story, his message of how Jesus loved us enough to provide a way of salvation. That it's God's word. And then I would encourage you, if you believe it's God's word, give them a testimony that I believe this is the word of God. That it's useful for teaching and training all of God's people for their ministry before God. The, the kids are hearing that. Will you testify to that before them? Did you hear about uh, what happened in one of our kids' ministry classes in Sunday school? The teacher was teaching recently about history. The Old Testament, how God's word was alive then and through the prophets. Uh, but during that time, the great power was placed in kings and queens. And one little boy says, yeah, I, I know kings and queens are powerful. That teacher quickly said to the whole class, but no matter how powerful a king and queen may be, there's always a higher power at hand. And the little boy said, oh, I know. Mom and dad says it's always in the aces, okay? <laughs> kids, kids will get that kind of idea. But here's what I want you to know. In all truthfulness, we believe the highest power that we can base our life on, the, the greatest knowledge as elders and ministers of this church that, that we have put before us to guide us and, and to direct this entire church is that we value biblical truth. That, that is our number one first value that we guide our, our decisions by and make, make a, a course for this church and, and our ministry we're going to be doing. Interestingly enough, right before the pandemic hit, we established our core values and we're like, is it too basic to, to say that we value biblical truth? And no, we, we committed to it, and it was the number one. Guys, I can't help but tell you uh, multiple times during the pandemic where we went back to making a decision, what would, what would the Word of God lead us to say? And it guides our thinking. It guides our directions. We value biblical truth. Why? Because it's God's perfect Word. Now, if we really view it that way as God's holy word, it changes the way we interact with it, the way our life revolves around it. But how? Here, here's the first way I want to submit to you, personally and as a church and as brothers and sisters in Christ. If we're going to grow deep, we must completely submit to God's word. We've got to submit to it as authority. Think about it this way. If God's word truly came from heaven, from him, it is a greater and has higher value than any other thought or thinking the world has ever seen greater than any human wisdom, any other practice. It's more important than, than anything that I may know, think, or even feel. Uh, God's word trumps all that. So take a step further. If it's greater than anything I can think or even feel, I would submit to you it's greater than anything you can know, think, or feel. And I know that may be offensive to you, but we value God's word from the word of God himself from heaven, so it means that it's more important or more valuable than anyone's thinking or feeling anywhere. And I know that's not politically correct or popular, but it's true. Here's how it applies to me first. When my thoughts, opinions, and yes, feelings differ from God's word, God's word wins. Just remember this simple thing. The word wins. Some people say, well, I love God. I really love what Jesus did for me on the cross. Oh, I'm so thankful for that. But the idea of really listening to a, a book that was written so long ago, it, it seems to be uh, meaningless today. I, I don't think I can do that. But look what God's word says in Jesus, his words himself. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. He says, obey my teachings, obey, obey my words. If my thinking is different than the word, then guess who's wrong? I'm wrong. You've heard me say that before. Uh, one of the things I'm not pr too proud to say this, when my thinking is different than the word, I'm wrong. It happens. You can ask Tiffany. She'll, she'll tell you, okay? She, she'll let you know that, that my thinking is often wrong, but, but when it's wrong compared to God's word, it has to change in that way. So think about this. It doesn't matter what you think, what I think, what the culture thinks, what the government thinks, even what the thinking of old uh, church tradition is, if it's different than God's word, God's word wins. Its thinking has the authority over all of us. 
And in that, we can grow deep because it will never let us down. Here's, here's another thing. It's, these are going to be a little easier than this, not, not so offensive probably. But the next thing, if we're going to grow deep, we've got to passionately pursue the word. There's some things that are pretty easy to passionately pursue, and we're all different in this. Now that school's back upon us, GU students are back in town or coming to town. Uh, we're back at, at being comments in education. Uh, homeschool's meeting in the building again. Academia is all around us again. And some of you are like, man, I love that. I get fired up. That's very natural for you to pursue that. Others of you, it's athletics. Hey, the comments are back on the football field. Soccer's back in gear. There's cross country. There's volleyball. There's all these things going on. I'll, I'll leave out some because we're passionate about all these different things. But some of you, that's just what's natural. How about those Cardinals? Pull holes, two home runs last night. Well, some of us just naturally fall into that. Others of you, it's about automobiles. It could be about anything. But I wonder if we naturally and passionately pursue God's word like we do things of this world. If you want to grow deep, there's a time when you say, I'm going to pursue this. It, it's, it really matters to me. We all have things we pursue. Last week, I shared with you about the time I met my wife, Tiffany. Strangely enough, if you follow the story, here's the reality. I met her in her hometown, in her home church, Streeter, Illinois, Central Church of Christ. I had just committed to a year-long internship at that church. I met her, and I made up in my mind, I said, I think I'll pursue her with passion. Now, I didn't tell her that right off the bat. There was two problems. One was I made a contract. I wouldn't date anyone from church. Little hiccup in the, in the pursuit. But secondly, this is even a bigger deal probably. I couldn't even pursue to get to know her very much because while I moved to town, she moved away to college. And so here I am uh, desiring to pursue her, but she's not there. So we started to have a relationship just to get to know each other. Not really a dating relationship, but just a relationship of, of getting to know each other, and I did it in an old school way. While she was gone at college, we began to communicate to develop our relationship. Now, you have to understand this was in, yes, the 90s. Anybody remember the 90s? <laughs> well, how did you communicate with her? Well, I'm sure you Skyped with her every day, right, or FaceTimed. We didn't have that. I didn't even have a cell phone. I want to remind you, I did not get my first cell phone until I had my first full-time job. Well, so I didn't call her on the phone. Why? Because I was staying at an elder's house. It'd be like me staying at Brian Grove's house, the chairman of the elders, and me racking up a phone bill in the 90s. I'd have been out, okay? So you know what I did every night when things were done? I got out my laptop that's about this thick, okay? And I plugged it into a portable modem in the house to the uh, dial-up network while the, the elder was already in bed. He wasn't going to be on the phone anymore. And I plugged it in, and it sounded a little bit like this. Listen to this, see if you can remember this. Remember that sound? You're waiting. Is it going to connect? Yes, it connected. Are you all excited? It, it, you guys remember that? This is how the communication for Tiffany and I began. And then if you were on AOL, uh, the little guy you're pursuing with passion, you're running, and then you connected. You were really excited because your friends were there, right? Those logos, man, they were high tech. Look at that. Look at all that, all that color. 8-bit probably, right? Now, here's the reality. Whenever I was connected, it, doesn't, it didn't mean it was over, though. Because Tiffany had not been connected, because she was in college, probably doing all these college things. But occasionally, when I'd be connected, I would be the surprise. I'd be late, waiting for the sound. I already heard the sound of the internet connecting. I would be waiting for her to come into the, the message, instant message room, where there were no pictures. It was just icons and, and text. But I was always looking for this sound, no matter where I was at in the house. I couldn't find it on the computer, but I found it on my phone. I just want you to listen to this sound. This is what I was listening for all those nights. Listen. Anybody remember that sound? When you would hear that sound, it meant that she opened the door to the room and she was ready to have a conversation. And you know what I'd do when I'd hear that sound? Maybe it was in the bathroom or the bedroom. You know what I'd do? I would log off and be like, it's time to go to bed, wouldn't I? No. I would sit at that computer and wait to have a conversation with the girl I was pursuing. Or would I hear that sound and turn on the TV and catch the, the, the latest episode, a rerun of Andy Griffith? No, I didn't do that. I gave my full attention to, to hearing from the person I was pursuing. I say all that to say with you, and you can catch a glimpse if you've ever been in a pursuit of a relationship. That is the way we're to pursue the Word of God with passion. 
Not, not with it on a shelf and saying, I'll open it next month or, or, or maybe next week, but, but on a regular basis. The, Psalms, this, the psalmist puts it this way in Psalms 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When, when, when can I go to meet with God? The psalmist is saying, God, I want to know you. I want to, be, I want to hear that sound of you drawing me in. I'm ready. My, my, my soul pants for you in, in, a, in a strong way. Are we that passionate for God's word? He says, when can I go to meet with you? This was a question the psalmist probably really struggled with because he didn't have a lot of text that he could read. He was really wanting to have a, a connection with God spiritually. When, when can I meet with you? Here's the cool part about when can I go to meet with God? Every time you open his word. You don't have to wait for a ding. You don't have to, to, to wait for the internet to connect. You don't have to, to wait for you have electricity. There's so many things. We recently lost power at our house and at church. We shut down in our world. Guys, we can go before God and meet with him no matter the circumstances. And we need to pursue him with passion. That's how you're going to grow deep. It's really not that difficult. In fact, here's the next thing. It even gets simpler. So this is good. If you're not following along, here, maybe you can get this one. If you want to grow deep, we really got to read God's word. I mean, really, read it. This summer, uh, Ben Allen preached on one of the Psalms, and we were just diving into about the importance of reading the Psalms. He says, if you want to know the Psalms, anybody remember what Ben said? Read the Psalms. And I would say much the same thing. If you want to know God, if you want to dive deep with him, read his word. Be very careful that you don't get caught up in just reading commentaries or Bible studies or, or books about God's word. While those things can be helpful... The majority of your time diving deep with God needs to be in his word. It doesn't have to be in a book like this. It can be on a device. It can be in audio form. But we have to spend time in his word. You might say, well, what type of word should we be reading? I would strongly suggest, uh, while not commentaries and just Bible studies, actually get a good translation of the word. Uh, there are also paraphrases of word. And what a paraphrase version is one man's or one woman's thoughts about a text and they put it in their own words. That's dangerous. We need to make sure we're in a good translation like the King James Version or the NIV or the ESV like we have in the pews here at church or the New Living Translation. We used to be a church. I grew up in a church that went from King James to NIV. And now most churches in our movement are ESV or New Living Translation. Because in all honesty, the new versions of, King, of NIV are not as strong as they used to be. You didn't know they changed it, but the more and more they changed it, culture. But we need to let the word win, so we need to make sure we have a good translation. The NIV is still solid, but there are better translations. So let, you may say, well, what is the best translation? I want to read the very best translation for me. You know what the best translation is for you? One you'll read. Sometimes well, I've got eight translations, they're good, and you haven't read any of them for a year. We need to be reading God's Word. If you don't have a copy of God's Word that you can read, take one of these. Just take it. Today, uh, there's a bunch over on the pew, over on the uh, chairs over there, they're in the pews. Take one. If you know a friend that needs a Bible, take one. Uh, be praying. Uh, ben Harris and I are developing a plan with John Wright, who spoke today. We're going to try to get a copy uh, through the Gideons into our students to give to one of their friends at school in September. In our goal, we're going to start praying that our students would give a Bible to one of their friends at school. Here's the thing. You can do that. How, how do we expect our students to do that if, if you're not willing to do that? If you know a friend that needs a Bible, give them one of ours. And just pray they would begin to read it. They would know God. There, there's benefit from it. Look at Psalms 119. David says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. We're all trying to live better and not sin. One of the greatest tools to resist temptation is putting God's word in our hearts. Jesus said this, if you hold to my teaching or you're really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is a reoccurring thing. The more we put God's word in our lives, it sets us free for living, from sin, from so much. But we've got to put in our lives his teachings, his word. Being spiritually strong is very similar to being physically healthy. Now, follow me on this. The older I get, the further I get away from 40... The harder it is to stay physically fit and, and, and just healthy. But you know what I've decided to do? Uh, most months I'll like eat two salads a month. I'll be like, why ain't, why ain't I healthy? You know, two, two salads a month, it, why, why isn't my body responding? Well, I'll eat all the junk the rest of the month long, okay? 
It is nutrition that makes us healthy. In a very similar way, we can't consume the Word of God once or twice a month and say, God, why aren't you changing my life? Why aren't I grow, growing to be more like Jesus? Why, why am I not able to resist sin? Now, I will admit there are times in my life where my physical body has been a little bit messed up, broken, or out of whack, and I have received a couple shots that in one dose of medicine corrected a lot that was going on. I also didn't sleep for two days, but that's a whole other story. The reality is there are times medicine can give us a big shot in the arm to change our lives. In much the same way, at times in our lives, we can read a passage and be like, this is a game changer. My life is forever changed, but you got to read it. But more times than not, you know what makes us healthy spiritually? is a constant, steady, nutritional diet of His Word that we read daily and on a regular basis. And we're nourished and we're strengthened. God's Word is amazing. Someone said about two months ago, well, Tyson, it really seems like we're pushing God's Word a lot. We're talking about the Bible. It really seems to be more of an emphasis than ever. What's going on? There's no apology, apology that emphasis is on God's Word. I don't think you can overemphasize God's Word. Now, I think you can have a wrong emphasis on it. In fact, there are churches that make being a Christian all about studying the Word, and that's all they do. You know what that is? They're, they're, they're Bible uh, aware, but they're not doing anything. The more you read the Bible, you know what the Bible is going to tell you to do? To worship, to, to pray, uh, to serve, to, to have a joyful life, to resist sin. If your Bible reading just has you read the Bible, you're not reading the right part of the Bible. Bible reading is going to cause us to have action. And that's the next thing I want us to know. If we're going to grow deep, we're going to practice the Word of God. Not just read it. Look at what, look at what James says. Do not merely listen to the Word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at his face goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently in the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So the Bible clearly says, read it and then do it. Those who consider themselves religious, yet do not keep tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. He says, you can read all the word of God, but if you don't control your own words, it's, it's, all, it's a fake. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So here's some application, and it goes right into our day of service. You, you know the main people, the first round, uh, the, the baseline of people we're going to serve according to this scripture? Widows and orphans, single moms, single grandmothers who, who, who need a little bit of help, uh, boys and girls who aren't living with their mom and dad, we're going to focus on those needs. So if you know a, a single mom or a widow that, that has a need, make sure we know. We're going to partner with the Restore Network to, to do some things, some amazing things for uh, boys and girls who are not living with mom and dad, who are on their own in some ways. And on the day of service, we're going to try to go beyond that and meet people's needs that can't serve themselves. So if you have a need or you know someone has a need, let us know. Because on the day of service, we're going to try to put into action immediately after we worship together what God would have us do. Can it just be September 25th? I hope not. I sure don't think so. So what are you going to do today to put the Word of God into action? Don't just be hearers of the Word. Be doers of the Word. There's one last thing that I want to challenge you with today, maybe the most important. We're going to grow deep in the Word by meeting Jesus. We all come to God in a little different way. Spirituality is not something you can just say one plus one equals two. But, but drawing close to God uh, can come a number of different ways, and we often do it privately. There are times whenever I've been worshiping God, whether it's with you in this place or on a retreat or in my car alone, and God reveals himself, and, and I have this great time of worship and praise and, and peace before him in his presence. It's amazing. Yours may be different. Maybe it's the exact same. There's other times when I can be praying, whether by myself or in groups of 100, and it feels like I'm right there with God, just him and I. But you know, in all of those spiritual experiences where I can draw near to God, the grounding factor is regular, spending regular time in His Word and being with Jesus. Since January, I've recommitted to being God's Word every morning. Very first thing, 
Often before I get a drink, before I brush my teeth, even before I turn the light, I'll get my phone out and go to the scripture that we're sharing in together as a family. And I'll ask God, hey, God, what are you revealing to me today? What do I need to change about my life? How is Jesus being shown to me in this passage? And I ponder it. And you know, an amazing thing has happened since January. I have become more confident and, and, and more uh, just fully aware that God has a word for me every day, every time I open this, because his word is alive and active to grow us, to prepare us for his will and his purpose. And every time we open it, we can be with Jesus because he is the word. I want to end with this. In John chapter 1, here's what the Gospel of John says. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You're like, okay, what word is he talking about? Well, it goes on to explain. Praise God. Look what it says. And the word became flesh. So the word that was with God became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the father's side he has made him known so what god has done through his word was given it to us in the text form but he's also given it to us in the flesh in jesus so what's what's a miraculous thing is when we read the word we're with jesus and and when the word became flesh he became our savior and there will be a day for those who believe what the Word says, the good news that Jesus came uh, to die for our sins and, and was crucified on the cross and was buried and, and is risen and is coming again. For those who believe that and are changed by that, we will be with Him forever. Today, if you are ready to make that decision that, that Jesus is who He says He is and you can trust Him, we welcome that. Would you stand with us as we prepare to sing? I'm going to pray. And if you would like to give your life to Jesus, if you would like to make that confession of faith that you believe He's the Son, the Messiah, the one that, that God sent in the form of the Word, in the form of the flesh, to be our Savior, and we welcome that. That's what unites us. Father in heaven, thank you for today. I thank you for your word in the Bible form. I thank you for the word in Jesus. I thank you that he saves us. Father, if there's someone here today that has just opened it up just a little bit, maybe in their hearts, man, I pray that you would fully begin to reveal yourself to them and they would be open to to following Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Son of God, in all his innocence, here walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is, he's acquainted with our grief. The man of sorrow, son of suffering, blood and tears. How can it be that there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds? Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Our distant and removed, but you chased us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner you were grace, and the broken you embrace, and in the end the proof is in your wounds. Yes, in the end the proof is in your Oh, blood and tears, how can it be that there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds? Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the sun of sun. Your cross.
cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all oh, praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all oh, praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your God who comes in the flesh, our God who was crucified and raised to life. Amen. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us in worship today. Uh, we want to invite any uh, college students or uh, maybe young adults who are new to the area here today uh, after service. Just come meet us uh, up here, uh, here at the front of the stage. Some of our uh, young adult leaders would love to meet you. And we also have a gift for you. Uh, so yeah, other than that, have a wonderful week. Go in peace and worship and serve the Lord. Show